Welcome to the Beauty and Battle podcast, where we talk about winning in marriage by waging a war. I'm Jason Benham. I've got my girlfriend slash wife, Tori Benham, with me, and we are here to talk to you about how Satan tries to get you to fight face-to-face with your spouse, but God designed you to fight shoulder-to-shoulder against Satan so that you can win in your marriage. Fighting together draws you together. We cannot wait to jump in. So here we go. So today we're talking about dealing with insecurity in marriage. Something Tori has never felt. Mm, never. <laughs> <laughs> if you read our marriage book, you'll know I, I felt a little insecure dating back to a 13-year-old heartbreak, seventh grade dance party. She mm. didn't ask me to dance. She asked my buddy Ryan. What was she thinking? I hate Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a good friend of mine still to this day. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, what we're talking about today in dealing with insecurity is that intimacy Mm-hmm. which is something that we can't live without. Right. We're going to talk about intimacy in a second. Um, intimacy often reveals insecurity. Right. The closer you get to somebody, mm-hmm. <laughs> the more insecurities show up. Yeah. And we also know that our number one core need as a human is security. Yeah. And so it's it's a tough one when these insecurities yeah. rear their ugly head, right? And then our security is breached. That's exactly right. What was the... What was the um, we saw something to her on YouTube. This was probably 10 years ago. And this this dude, he walks into a fast food restaurant and then the the um, server, I don't know what oh, she like called Saturday it. The chick, she's like, something? security, security. <laughs> this one's got to go. This one's got to go. Security. Yep. I forget what it was. It was like Saturday Night Live or something. That was like 20 years ago. Yeah. So anyway, um, and then, well, before we get into this, I want to play a new song that I found. And it, this is exciting because today is Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. And um, I played this really cool song for Tori. I, I, got a, I got a little Valentine's gift for Tori. She's not a gift girl, but I found this cool little thing where I could take our favorite picture and turn it into a watercolor canvas. Yes. Oh, it was really cool. I absolutely loved that gift. It was so sweet. And you're right. I'm not, my primary love language is not... Um, gifts but it was such a pleasant surprise i absolutely loved it and it was so thoughtful so sweet um and it was very so i think it was for my birthday that you like this is the second occasion where you were like you're surprising me with gifts yeah with little things and little meaningful things i think for so long we're like oh our love language isn't really gifts so let's just kind of not do that and well it's still not but yeah whatever but it's so meaningful and it 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 made my day so yeah well love it and the reason why I tell you that is because when she came out, uh, when she came into the hotel room where we were, we were staying, we were going to go see our son play basketball, and um, we got this really cool hotel room in Asheville, and so I set it all up. You know, She's like coming in, getting ready to go to the game, and I put the picture up, and then I found this great song yes. by Brandon Lake. Yep. Nothing new, I do. And it's the wedding version. It's so good. And I had played a Brandon Lake song earlier. Again, this is the guy, he's a praise and worship singer for, yeah. for Bethel or Elevation. Uh, he's on his own now. But he was with... I forget who. One of the two. Yeah. And um, yeah, and now he's on his own and he, he created an album for his wife. And it's just so full good. of love songs and they're so good. But listen to this one. This is called Nothing New, I Do, Brandon Lake. Good, isn't it? That's good, right? I love it so much, and I just have to add that. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, do the things that you did before. Like if, you, yeah. if you've lost your the loving feelings, if you've lost some of the romance, just go back and, and yeah. redo. And for us, when we were dating, you used to always like that. There was a fine, big, cool songs, fine, cool songs that were like dedicated to me like this. Oh, I found this song for you. And you would go out to dinner. I have a new song for you. Or yeah. 
we'd have like um, home dinner dates a lot of times in back in Connecticut yeah. when we were dating. And you'd have like a new song. And so I think that's why it just meant so much because it did bring me back. It yeah. was like, I feel like we're dating again. Like this is exactly what we did when we were dating. You'd surprise me with little gifts. And even though there was like this long stint of us not really giving gifts, I think it what well, it's just like those memories that come flooding back when you do the old yeah. things that are just really important. And um, they just, they mean a lot. So score for me Good on job. that one. Yeah. I was pretty proud of myself. And uh, in that moment, I was wishing that Tori's love language was phys- physical touch, but you know, we had a game to go to. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, let's talk about insecurity um, because we're going to get to that in terms of intimacy. The more intimate you are with someone, the more of your insecurities are revealed. Mm -hmm. Okay, but intimacy is a very important thing. We're meant for intimacy. God literally created created us for intimacy. Intimacy is to be fully known and fully accepted. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be fully formed human beings, we need to be fully known and fully accepted by God, which we are, and others. Okay. Um, when it comes to being intimate with others, God literally anchored us so that our our um, ability to grow and have character is determined by how intimate we are with others. Mm. Now, of course, there are different levels of intimacy, right? Obviously, right. But you need to be vulnerable with another and know that they accept you, and they need to be vulnerable with you and know that you accept them. That's intimacy, to be fully known, fully accepted. Wow. And I'm intimate with Tori. She knows me in ways that nobody else knows. I know her in ways that nobody else knows. Right. And when you allow yourself to do that, you realize intimacy is built on vulnerability. Right. Yes. You know, but being vulnerable is hard. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Why? Because someone will see something about you that you already don't like about you. Yeah. Yep. Whatever that thing is. Hmm. That's how intimacy reveals insecurity because you can't be intimate without vulnerability and vulnerability opens you up for people to see things that you don't even like about you. Mm. Now, I say all that to say this, Song of Solomon is a book about intimacy and we're going to dive into Song of Solomon 1 um, because this book is so powerful. It's a physical picture of intimacy in marriage and it points to the intimacy that we have with God, right? Specifically the church with Jesus. Right. So... As an individual, we relate with God as father. Mm. So I'm God's son, you're God's daughter, right? Right. But as the church, collectively, we relate to Jesus as bride. Mm. So I don't relate to God as bride, Mm -hmm. right? I relate to Jesus as bride in terms of my identity as the church. Right. But God is my father. So this the book Song of Solomon is written to show us what the church is like yeah. in their relationship with Jesus. And it uses a physical relationship for that. It's specifically the relationship with Solomon and his betrothed bride. Okay. The first, I think, four or five chapters of Song of Solomon, they're engaged mm. and they're talking about wanting to be intimate with each other. Mm-hmm. And then after that, um, it goes into where they're actually married and they're like hooking up all the time with each other, right? which is a great thing. And so they're totally being, t- I mean, as sensual, yeah. As you can possibly be, they got it in. Yeah. They kind of speak the book of in code Solomon. a little bit, but mm-hmm. if you are at all discerning at all, you're like, "Whoa, this is pretty explicit." <laughs> yeah. Well, but just check out what happens here because in chapter one we see the woman, okay, the engaged betrothed bride, wanting to be intimate, intimate with her betrothed husband. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now they can't be intimate at that moment, but she's talking about, "Hey, I want this with you." Listen to what she says. Verse one comes right out of the gate. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. So like she's really enjoying the thought of being intimate with him. Right. Because why why would she be feeling that? Because God made her that way. Mm-hmm. God made us that way. He wants us to want intimacy with another mm-hmm. person. That type of intimacy, like sexual intimacy in marriage, 100%. Yeah. You should want it. He created that desire. That, yes. Yeah. Both partners should want it. Mm-hmm. If one partner wants it, the other partner doesn't want it. Well, then we just got you got to talk through that. Mm-hmm. Something might be happening. You know, there might be a lot of stuff going on. Stress is one of the biggest killers of sex. Mm-hmm. So obviously, we're not talking about sex here, but we are talking about intimacy. So, but listen to what happens. So, in verse one, she's talking about how much she wants to be intimate with him. Then she shifts. She shifts from talking about intimacy to talking about insecurity. Mm. So she stops thinking about him, and in that moment. She turned the focus from him and them, when I say him and them, 
him and their relationship. Yes. She turned the focus from him and them to herself. Look in verse six. She says, do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. Mm -hmm. Now stop. She was just talking about how she wanted to be like, she wanted to make out with him. She wanted to be like naked and get kissed by him all over. Yeah. And now she's like, hey, don't stare at me because I'm dark. But intimacy is a matter of focus. If you focus on the other person and how they accept you, you can be intimate. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on yourself and your own issue, whatever it is that you don't like about yourself, you can't be intimate. Your insecurity will block your intimacy. Wow. So for her specifically, she didn't like her dark skin. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, she started comparing herself to other women that mm -hmm. didn't have skin as dark as hers. Yeah. And she thought they were prettier than her. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this really, really struck me because right? I know that back in the day that, I mean, I've read this in history books, you know, that it was, you know, kind of frowned upon, upon to be tan, to get, to, to be darker yeah. and that the fair skinned woman oh, yeah. was honored. Back in the 1800s. And, yeah. Back in the 18. So this is, you know, way back, obviously. And so there was a trend. There was mm -hmm. something that, you know, there was a culture that said, this is what's beautiful. The whiter, the better. This is what, you know, what men want. This is right. And, yeah. and it's so applicable to today. And what we're, women are facing, and especially young girls on social media are facing all the time with this comparison and what is trending, right? Yeah. What kind of Stupid. beauty trends there are, which is so silly mm -hmm. that like somebody um, else tells us what is beautiful and so, you know, there's trends that are beautiful. Like, yeah. you know, I talk about this with my girls all the time. Like, isn't it just, it's so silly that there are body trends. Like, you know, yeah. when I was, when I was a teenager, yeah. like if somebody said, you've got a big butt, you, that would have been like, the worst thing you could oh, say, of course. To, to say, say to a girl that would be yeah. so like, she, she'd be so upset. Right. Yeah. Because it's like, that wasn't trending yeah. back in whenever. Then Sir Mix a lot. Yeah. Comes up with his song. And the Kardashians or whatever. <laughs> and now, you know, you hear like, if you, you know, you hear the opposite and I'm like t trying to help the girls. Are these, like, this is so silly. These are body trending yeah. things that like, who, who determines what beauty is? Who says what beauty is? Right? That's right. And it's so important that we don't fall into these traps of comparison as mm. women of, oh, well, this is what the world says is beautiful. Yeah. This is what, you know, culture deems as, as sexy or whatever yeah. it may be. And that we cannot be vulnerable with what God has given to us. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think about, um, you know, I was listening to a podcast with um, Dr. Deborah Folletta. She's a, a Christian psychologist. She's, great. She's a Christian counselor, a marriage wrote, counselor. Wrote Married Sex. Yeah. Great mm -hmm. book. And she was talking about how scientists used to believe that how you feel in influenced what you think, but that more modern research now shows that how you think impacts how you feel. So yeah. Thoughts lead to feelings and feelings lead to behavior. Yes. And so that's why our thoughts are so important. So if you believe, if you think that this, you know, this, um, what the culture says is beautiful, what is trending is what you ought to desire and what, you know, your husband would want because yeah. that's what's trending. It's, it's all, it's, it's a lie, mm -hmm. right? Like when you, we have to be aware of what those thoughts are. They can be very subconscious when you are seeing them in, in, um, on social media and you're seeing them in the magazines that you pass by at the grocery store, right? Yeah. Like those things can really contribute to your thoughts about yourself and the value that you place on your, on what God has given to you. And yeah. so I just think it's so important. Like this is exactly what she, that happened to her. Obviously the culture back then was to be fair. Yeah, that's right. And she was working out in the sun and she was dark and she's like, suddenly she's focused on what she has versus what the culture says is is good mm. and what's trending and she suddenly does not you know is focused in on what she looks like and doesn't is afraid of intimacy she's afraid to be vulnerable because now yeah. she's crippled with insecurity yeah and so it just makes me think of that the verse in Romans 12 like don't be conformed to the patterns of the world but transformed by the renewing of your mind and so it is not what culture says is is right or wrong or perfect or you know what whatever whatever the trend is that's not what makes you beautiful mm. 
it, the, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Right. And if your husband is telling you that you're beautiful and he loves this, this, and this about you, well, can you believe that? Will mm. you believe that? Yeah. Or are you just stuck in the pattern of the world of what they're telling you is beautiful? Yeah, that's really good. Listen, when you're insecure, you think everyone else sees what they don't like about you rather than what they do like about you. Yeah. Because you're thinking too much of yourself. Mm. Okay. There's a big difference between self-consciousness and self-awareness. Self-awareness is you, you're, you're aware of the emotions that you're having and the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Self-consciousness is you're aware and you believe that everybody else is thinking about you and that they don't like what they see mm. or they don't like what they hear. So that, that is terrible. Like we don't want to be there. But if you turn that focus to yourself, as a result, you're going to with, want to withhold certain information about yourself. Mm. When you do that, you can't be truly intimate which hinders your growth as a human. Yeah. So until you deal with your insecurity, it's going to negatively affect your intimacy. Wow. Okay, but now here's a cool part of this story in Song of Solomon. She's sitting here saying, hey, let's be intimate. Like, I can't wait until we can be intimate. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, wait a second. Hold on. I forgot. I got dark skin. Oh, and I'm sure you don't like that. Mm -hmm. But listen, because the very thing that she thought that he hated, he loved. Yeah. Verse 9 and 10 in in Song of Solomon 1, he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. How many white horses have you seen? I mean, you've seen some, but most horses are dark. Right? They're dark. And he says, your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. See, he didn't just accept her. He loved everything about her. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing that we see that right in Song of Solomon 1. Mm. And I just think there are so many people out there, you know, married couples out there that think, oh, well, my husband doesn't like this about me or my wife doesn't like this about me. Well, you know, in reality, if you're just sweet and kind and you pursue each other's hearts like that, mm -hmm. the stuff that you may not like about yourself is going to be the very thing that they actually love. Mm -hmm. They love it. Yeah. You know? And so I just think that that is, it's just a strong, powerful thing. Now, on that foundation, there are three responses to insecurity within intimacy that will help us overcome it. Hmm. Okay. So you got to recognize it's natural for you to experience some insecurity the more intimate you get. Now, how do we overcome that? Number one, be accepting of your spouse. Hmm. Okay. This is so important. Like you need to have a no matter what mentality um, if you really want to draw close to your spouse. Yeah. Like it's like, I love you no matter what. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you, we've been married 40 years and I know you don't look like you did when you were 18 and I don't want you to. Mm -hmm. I'm more attracted to you now than back then. It has nothing to do with the physical because mm -hmm. there's so much more important yeah. aspects of you than that. Right. Right. Revelation 320, I think, gives us a clear, clear picture of this when Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He who opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Mm. It doesn't say I will come in. He doesn't say I'll come in and I'll clean house. Yeah. He'll say, I'll dine with you, which basically means your house can be a wreck and Jesus is knocking on the door and you're like, oh crap, it's Jesus. I got to, I got to fix this place up. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Just let me in. Yeah. And you go in and he doesn't look at any of the mess and he just sits down and says, hey, you want to eat? Mm. And then the whole time you're eating, you're having conversation with each other and he's just looking right in your eye. Yeah. And then he walks, turns around and says, hey, I'd like to come back tomorrow. Now, all of a sudden you, when he leaves, you end up cleaning up the house on the basis of his acceptance of you, yes. not on the basis of you trying to be accepted. So good. Right? So yes. you've first got to be accepting of your spouse. Mm. Okay? So good. And the more you fully accept your spouse, the more you're able to receive their acceptance. So follow wow. me. Yeah. The more you accept your spouse, warts and all, mm -hmm. scars and all, the more you're able to receive their acceptance because that's number two. So number one, be accepting of your spouse. Number two, receive acceptance from your spouse. Mm. The more you focus on your spouse, the more you can receive their love. Yeah. Don't focus on what you don't like about yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on what you don't like about yourself. Yeah. Just focus on your spouse. Yeah. And let them love you. It's so it's so true because projection is a real thing. Yeah. Right? Projection is real. Like if you are if you're constantly in a state of negativity, if you think negative thoughts about other people and you're always annoyed oh, yeah. and you don't have any grace for other people and their idiosyncrasies and yeah. all these things, right? What happens? You will be so self conscious. You will be so you're... self conscious because that comes right back on you. You yeah. then expect that other people think like you think. Mm. But when you think 
well of other people and you, sh- you exhibit grace and you see the best in people, you start to assume that they're doing the same yeah. with you. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's, that's the first two. Number one, be accepting of your spouse. Number two, receive acceptance from your spouse. Okay. When you're receiving acceptance from your spouse, you're, you're focusing on what you're focusing on your spouse, not what you don't like about yourself. However, if there's an issue that you can control, then do it. That's number three, be acceptable to your spouse. So number one, be accepting of your spouse. Number two, receive acceptance from your spouse. And number three, be acceptable to your spouse, which means if you're insecure about something you can change, Mm -hmm. change it, Mm -hmm. sucker. (laughs) <laughs> but if you're insecure about something you can't change, accept it. Yeah, exactly. So let me say that again. You have to understand this. If you're insecure about something you can change, change it. Mm-hmm. If you're insecure about something you can't change, accept it. So let's talk about being insecure about something you can change. If there's something that you do that's unattractive to your spouse or something that, that's true about you and you can change it and you know that it's unattractive to your spouse, do everything in your power to fix it. Yes. And just the process of trying to fix it, your spouse will be attracted to, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't mean you have to like be, you know, if you graduated college at 180 pounds and now you're 280, it doesn't mean, oh, unless I get to 180, she's not going to be attracted. Well, no, Yeah. but it does mean if you just start, like if, if you know that weight is an Mm -hmm. issue, we'll just, you know, exercise a little bit, just eat healthy. That's all. Cleanliness. If you know that yeah. that you smell after a workout <laughs> or you smell, you know, at the end of the day, smell. whatever it is, you can change that, right? Yeah. Like one of the things that we're we are very intentional about is having gum oh, yeah. at our nightstands. And that's funny. Because that's imp- it is important that your breath smells good to me and it's important that yeah. breath smells good to you. It just is. You know, maybe to some of you that's not a big deal to us. <laughs> We're big smellers. But we're also very clean, <laughs> clean. Like I take three showers a day. I typically take three showers a day. And I'm very big on we do not get in bed at night mm-hmm. without having showered. Right? Yeah. Like that's the thing. And my dad, he was just oh, different. Geez. My dad, he's a morning shower his whole life. And at night, he just crawls up well, in bed. It's like, know, how I, do you do I that? I would imagine that years ago you didn't 75 have, you, years old. Yeah, you can't take that many showers. Maybe yeah. they didn't have that much hot water. Give the guy a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there are folks, but no, I like if Tori didn't shower before bed, then there would not be snuggling. Mm-hmm. So just FYI on that. Yeah. <laughs> but, and so that's something I can change. <laughs> yeah. But if you can, if there's something you're insecure about and you can change it, change it. You know, like if if you think that your spouse isn't quite attracted to you, then do this. Stop nagging. Stop complaining. Stop being negative. Start being nice. And what will happen is you'll start to feel like your spouse is more attracted to you. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if If you are insecure about something that you can't change, however, Mm -hmm. you need to accept it. Okay. And when you accept that aspect of you. Mm Mm-hmm. You're really accepting the God who made you like that. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I don't like my legs or I don't like my hair or I don't like my eyes or why do I have this? Or, like whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't control that. Yeah. It's like you you walk the way you walk. Mm-hmm. You, your voice is the way it is. I mean, God made that. It's like God made you that way. You need to accept it. And when yeah. you do, you are actually accepting God. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this will lead to intimacy with him. Wow. That's it. So yeah. now intimacy is built on acceptance, but you have to accept yourself first. Hmm. That's and that's so fulfilling the second commandment. Remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and yeah. then love your neighbor. As yourself. As yourself. Mm-hmm. It's it's the command that comes with a presupposition. Mm. I'm, it, we're not supposed to just love our neighbor. Yeah. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, as ourself, which tells us there's a presupposition. The presupposition is I have to love myself first. Mm. Not fall in love with yourself. Yeah. But love yourself, which means I accept God how you made me. Yeah. And you know what? I'm trying to make the best of what you've given to me yeah. in this body that I've got. One of my really close friends is Nick Boyacic. Mm-hmm. No arms, no legs. Yeah. And he is an absolute baller. Yeah. And I'm not joking when I say this. When Nick Boyacic comes into the room, mm-hmm. he has gravitas. Mm. No arms, no legs. Yet you just feel something from Nick. Like 100%. this dude is... He's got his crap together. Yes. Yep. I do have to say something funny. And I told Nick this and he laughed so hard. I had to I had to introduce him on mm-hmm. stage 
And uh, <laughs> I had to introduce him several times when we were at Life Surge. And then what I'm supposed to do is, is tell people who Nick is and all that kind of stuff. People get excited. Then I throw it to a video. Yeah. And then I welcome Nick to the stage. Well, on this occasion, I, <laughs> I said to everybody who Nick was. And then I said, and before Nick walks out here, mm-hmm. watch this video. Yeah. And I was like, oh, crap. He's not walking out here. But he he's, he's so wheeling cool out. that he he like rolls with. He laughed at out. it. He he makes comments about it all the time, and it's just like part of his humor. And he yeah, he's just amazing. He's not insecure about any no, of it. Not at all. Mm-hmm. And I've been around him so much, and he talks about all sorts of things. Yeah. You know, the the stuff that you would ever ask and question in your mind about somebody who doesn't have arms and legs. He's totally fine answering questions. Mm-hmm. Like he is just a man's man. And you know what? He dealt with his insecurity. Mm. You tell me there's nobody else on earth that could be more insecure than him. Yeah. And yet he's dealt with it and he's fine with it. And you can, he makes so many jokes about people with no arms and no legs because he's got that. Yeah. And and he's totally, and he laughs. And that's a guy who's dealt with his insecurity. Why? Because he honestly is focused on others. Yes. He is all about seeing souls be saved. He has such a vision for his life and so much purpose in his life that there's really, it's, it's almost as if there's not time for for the insecurities. Yeah. You know, it's like he just plows through it. I yeah. love what I love the most about his story uh, that was so inspiring to me is just this, the, you know, the influence his mom had in his life. Oh, she's a baller. And we had the privilege of meeting her this summer and spending yeah. a week with her and with their family. And oh my goodness, I'm just blown away by this mother because could you imagine just you know, the nurturing heart of a mother and how Mm. much you want to help and protect your child from anything that you can protect them from. Yeah. But, you know, his testimony is that his mother knew that if he was going to make it, if he was going to be able to overcome the obstacles that he was was given in life, then he was going to have to feel very capable and able. Yeah. Because he, you know, with, with his dis with him being disabled, yeah. you know, he's got, he had to, she had to show him that he was able. Yeah. And so basically he tells stories, you know, of, of him wanting a book on the shelf and saying, mom, I need you to get me the book. And she says, okay, I'll figure out a way to get it, buddy. Yeah. And he would figure out a way. And, and like, even as he's telling the story, she's, he's like, and she was so mean. She didn't, she, yeah. didn't, she wouldn't help me. He's like, you know what, though? It was the nicest thing she could have ever done for me was to show me that I am able, that I yeah. can do things that, you know, that everyone else would say that you can't. And she said, I just figured out how to do things. And you know what, Nick, and I, and I love when he says this line, he says, if you put the word go in front of disable, what do you get? God is able. Wow. And I'm just telling you, when it comes to your insecurity, run into it. Yeah. Run smack dab into mm. it. And if you're a spouse and you know that you're, uh, the per- your married partner is uh, insecure about something, then do what you can to help. Yeah, you know if that means that don't you can't talk about certain things at certain times in front of certain people. That's fine. Go ahead, do that. Mm. But at some point, you guys gradually like start to get better. Start to understand. My spouse fully loves me and accepts me just like I am. Mm. And in return, what you're going to do is you're going to fully love them and accept them just like they are. You're so not going to change. Yeah. You know, and, and in doing that, not only are you going to grow intimate with each other, you're going to grow intimate with God. So there are three keys. Be accepting of your spouse. Mm. Receive acceptance from your spouse. And and third, be acceptable to your spouse. If you're insecure about something you can change, change it. If you're insecure about something you can't change, accept it. Mm. And those keys will help you deal with insecurity in marriage. So good. I love that. Thank you, Song of Solomon. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to share a recipe with you guys um, that I made a couple of weeks ago. Um, every winter when it gets super cold, I think back to my childhood. And one of my core memories as a kid was ski club. We had ski club in Connecticut. I grew up in Torrington, Connecticut. And we had ski club every Monday night, like basically from the time I was in elementary school through high school, mm-hmm. I, I was on ski club. And it, you would just, you would ski from three o'clock until I think it was like six or seven. Mm. And then you would, I, my brother and I would come home ravenously oh, yeah. starving hungry, right? From just from skiing for that long. And oftentimes my mom, like her go-to meal for the Monday night ski club um, was hot dogs and potatoes. Yeah. And so, so good. and it would it would just hit the absolute spot. It was so simple, but yet it was me and my brother's favorite meal growing up. 
And when my brother um, went to college and he came to visit, you know, you and I just got married. The only meal I knew to make for him was hot dogs and potatoes. That's, <laughs> that's what we had all the time growing up. And that's he, cool. It was his favorite meal. It was one of my favorite meals. And it was just a go-to in our house. But back in back in Connecticut, you had Mucky's hot dogs. So oh, that was had, a little bit different. Yeah, we had the real deals. And so um, anyway, so this winter, every winter, I just crave it. It just brings me, brings yeah. me back to my childhood. And it's so simple, but I had to, and my kids love it too. But um, I found um, grass-fed, uh, what are they called? Po- Polish Polish sausage. Yeah. Grass-fed Polish sausage. It's by Tetons. Okay. You can get them at Costco. Grass-fed sausage, like what the pigs were eating grass? Yeah, that's... that's no, interesting. no, no, no. Wait a minute. Yeah, it says um, Polish sausage, but gra- it's made with grass-fed beef. Yeah, So I don't know why, why they call it. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm making up sausage but i know it says I if it's it said, polish sausage it's yeah, sausage yeah it's legit but it's, I mean, it's good but it says grass-fed beef okay so i don't oh so it's all beef it's all beef but okay. it says tetan it. polish i thought it was sausage. pork sorry well, ruined sausage, your vibe sausage would imply pork but i guess i don't know yeah what do we know yeah what do we know um but anyways um it is so so good yeah, i just it's love rocking. it basically all it's so simple i'll show you guys in a reel how i do it but um if you you know if you do it with um, the grass fed beef um, Polish sausage, then it's pretty healthy. Yeah, and I could eat it on my diet because there's just the healthy olive oil, and it's just onion. Uh, I use baby potatoes; those are the easiest ones, and then the Polish sausage, and it was so incredibly good, and it's so easy to make, and it just brings me back to Connecticut winters, mm. and I'm I was really craving the snow. Yeah. But you know, this has been a very warm winter so far. And you know what Tori and I are doing for uh, date night tonight? You know, happy dadgum Valentine's Day. We're going to uh, Indian street food. Oh, you guys. You know, Indian street food. If any of you have ever done, which I think there's several of you that have, um, one of our marriage intensive, two-day marriage intensives, and you come with us, we are going to bring you to downtown Davidson. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to walk around Davidson College and eat something we're, around we're there. We're waiting for the the couple that loves Indian because you have to oh, love yeah. Indian. You, you do. You have to really, really love it. And we are completely addicted to it. Thank you to Sabina and Jacob. Jacob William. Mm-hmm. Yes. And let me just say this. So Tori and I came in here, our podcast studio, which is also our guest suite where people do spend those two days for the marriage intensive. And she didn't like the way it smelled in here. So she had She's been having incense going this whole time, and now we're 33 minutes into this podcast, and I think I'm high <laughs> on incense. It is so strong. It's I, like the smoke is going into my nose. I love the smell of incense. Yeah. Well, Jason, Jason says- I'm not feeling like, so good. Jason thinks it smells like cigarettes in here, but I'm one of those weird people that likes the smell of cigarettes. Yeah, well, her grandparents smoked like- chimneys and, and uh yes and it totally reminds me of them and so every time i smell a cigarette i'm like oh it smells so good <laughs> hoppy and bobby <laughs> so tori cut straws in half and pretends like they're cigarettes you know <laughs> so anyway well thanks for hanging out with us hopefully you can deal with your insecurities so we don't have to call security oh, oh that was my good. gosh that was cheesy <laughs> all right thanks for hanging all out right, with us we'll see you guys we'll see you happy valentine's day yes Oh, 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 oh,